What's up, buddy? <laughs> Happy Monday, dude. Hey, man. Same to you. You sound solid today. Really? Yeah, you sound you sound refreshed, rejuvenated. You sound clear. I don't know if it's that uh, brisk Wisconsin air you've been breathing, but you sound good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, which probably means you're still sitting in your bed in your robe having your first sip of coffee. That's pretty much it. I'm <laughs> yeah, pretty back much to my it. and there's, <laughs> there's the old school landline. <laughs> Are you wow, me, is that a that sounds like a rotary landline? It really is. I yeah, well, in I'll, case you guys didn't know, this is the Crushing Iron Triathlon podcast, and if we are launching today a one eight hundred Crush Iron, and you can reach us uh, on Mike's rotary phone that is from nineteen ten. <laughs> and for for those of you who are uh, in your early twenties and have no idea what a rotary phone is, look it uh, up. Yeah, I'll post a picture in our close group yeah. today. <laughs> Um, that's pretty Stand. unbelievable right there. That's, that's good stuff, man. I don't know that, I don't recall the last time I've heard of a, a rotary phone. Uh, I, I feel, I feel special. I yeah. feel enlightened and, uh, but yeah, you, that's you what we do. Good. And you've been out of town for a few days and I saw you, I saw you getting your influencer game on yesterday in the crushing iron page with a little uh, video by the lake where they have iron man wisconsin yes that was uh, did you did you break the news that they've already canceled the swim no yeah it's the uh they've canceled the swim at wisconsin because there's ice on the water yeah 100 and what 70 something days out yeah but it's not looking good <laughs> yes yes so they were going to go ahead and cancel <laughs> it so if you're planning on doing wisconsin uh just plan on uh, on a, a bike and a run, and for a lot of athletes, that probably won't change their training too much at all, anyway. So no, they're going to uh, do that penguin start thing up there. Yeah, that I keep seeing all over. The- <laughs> everybody's been loving that share, and then a little overshare. But you usually, before I dive in, you usually have uh, a little extra on the topic side when you travel a, and then when you travel back home to Wisconsin. And <laughs> you keep bait me on this stomp- keep- stomping ground, so. <laughs> I figured I would give you the floor for a minute because usually you got something juicy coming up. Well, this is what happened last. Um, well, we were staying in Madison, of course, and downtown. And who we? You and that twenty-nine-year-old you met at the coffee shop. Yeah, we uh, okay. we took a little trip. You know, she's <laughs> a big basketball fan. She loves Points. Wisconsin high school hoops for some reason. Points. Uh so yeah. Well, no, me and my buddies went up and. Uh, they're big uh, coaches and stuff like that in the high school ranks up here in Wisconsin. So we went and watched the high school thing. And we watched some Badgers, watched them lose and stuff. But uh, anyway, we were downtown Madison, so uh, I always get out and sort of run part of the course. Ran part of the bike course yesterday. And, uh, well, the beginnings, you know, how they go through the greenway and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. Uh, I don't know, dude. My topic, I really don't have one. Man, you're coming in blank on a Monday? I know, I know. You you wasted it all on your influencer video, didn't you? <laughs> you wasted all of your creativity with your influencer video on our clothes. Which, if you didn't know, you have a, a clothes crushing iron Facebook uh, group that you can be a part of and, frankly, not be a part of if you listen to the first five minutes of this podcast and wondering what the hell you're doing spending this amount of time listening to us talk. But yeah. we do come to you every Monday and Thursday and have been for over 250 episodes. This is episode 251. Uh, we do talk triathlon. We talk life. We talk how they intermingle our experiences over the last five to ten years. And, uh, you know, definitely all the tips and the tricks, but no, uh, I got plenty of topics today, so I will uh, carry this podcast, uh, as I do once every 25 to 30 when you come up blank. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, big racing weekend. Uh, it seems like it was a, a I think St. Patty's day is probably the reason cause they have a lot of those holiday, holiday half marathons and uh i think in this was kind of goes back to a text i had with another athlete in terms of the amount of kind of antsiness that athletes also get this time you know we we always talk about athletes always crave benchmarks Mm -hmm. they crave uh data that specifically shows them a finite example of look i'm getting faster 
look, this is all working. I'm on the right track. This isn't all a big fat waste of time. And and while that's a huge that that often causes the biggest uh, issues in training because, and I think it's one of the biggest reasons why you see athletes. Uh, take huge chunks of, of training time and, and to make huge efforts in training uh, that they probably shouldn't and kind of put themselves and kind of dig themselves a hole where they go over training and they, they do these, you know, as we like to call the hashtag epic training days where they just blast themselves because they really, really beg to see improvement and that that, you know, again, fights in the, in the face of what we preach and what is proven to work, which is just consistent. You know, mm-hmm. consistent work over and over again. I, I do have to <laughs> – I do want to read a quick quote from one of our athletes that – this isn't all of what I want to talk about today, but uh, she ran a, a 10K this week and had a huge PR and just ran out of her mind, and she's been running really, really awesome. She said, I will <laughs> – she said, uh, I will forever be on team 80% meh training. Uh, <laughs> so I just boring, that man. Was, I know. I just thought that was so well put, just because it is. It, it's. It, I talked to athletes about that. The first, the kind of the first conversation we have, or the first email exchange is, is like, listen, you know, I'm I'm going to give you feedback, but you know, just so you know, ten percent of the workouts you do, you'll feel like a pro. You know, they'll feel like breakthroughs. The other ten percent, you're going to want to retire. The other eighty percent are just kind of, meh. They're uneventful. They're just kind of as is. They're you know they're they're standard they're just i got it done they're not fancy and i think that's that's such a hard thing to to grasp for some athletes to, and i think it varies depending on how long an athlete has been doing this and have they i think i think what it comes down to is how how many times and how long an athlete kind of sticks with what i would call just the that kind of a program because most athletes break off they they don't have the patience or the trust with either themselves or a coach to or a training plan, they don't have the patience to they they, they kind of get impatient with their patients. Uh, and, and they they'll be consistent for two to three to four weeks and then they lose all patience and say, God, I, I gotta see what I have today. I, I, I gotta see it. You know, I, I can't wait any longer. I've I've gotta go I've gotta take a risk. I've gotta go I've gotta go run twenty instead of thirteen because I gotta show myself I can do it. And I think we, we go through these ebbs and flows of of confidence and lack of confidence and and I think it's just how you I think it's very important for athletes to be able to to take a minute and let these thoughts sift through their mind and then make a judgment call and don't make it during a workout. It's so many athletes make these frankly really poor decisions during workouts uh, or right before a workout. It's like, you know what? Like something bad happened in their their day to day life, something something really discouraging, or they they or a great great thing or a, or a bad thing, you know, just some kind of some kind of good or bad thing, and they end up, they end up making a poor decision in training. And usually, and we've talked about this before, is that with with athletes, when you, just the same, just about the time you start to doubt things, something good is about to happen. Something you know, if you've had a string of of rough workouts. You're, you're you're probably more than likely due for a breakthrough. Yeah. If, if you're given the you know the the exact kind of rest, like I had an athlete uh, who I won't name her by name because I pick on her enough already, but she sent me an email on Friday. It was like yada yada yada. Don't look, I'm doing enough. Yada yada yada. I've got Boston coming up. Yada yada yada. I think I don't think I'm ready. Yada yada yada. This isn't the same running I've been. And I think this is our third Boston round together. Um, where she's qualified and we're still kind of digging deep on a few things. And so we went through an email exchange and then the next day she was like, Oh, I just ran 16 and a half miles in the morning and three and a half miles in the evening. I've never felt so energized. <laughs> I've, never, I've never felt this good after a run. And, and, and we've never done 20 miles in a day. And I was like, yeah, your email was just about 24 hours too early. Uh, but, but we find, but, but again, she didn't make any poor decisions and go out and run. 25 but i think the, the i think that the topic and the message i'm just trying to send is, is is the decisions that we make to continue to trust or not trust our patience and our plan when it comes to the amount of value in the amount of proven science frankly that tells you that consistency is king and that it's your ability to stretch out as many weeks and months uh, as you can together of consistent training with no you know, gigantic epic training days that that really helps your season. And then once you start to get into season, 
now you don't have to wait as long anymore. Uh, but I think the biggest trap you get into, and this is kind of what I want the topic to be about today, is once you get into racing season and you get a taste of it, you get a taste of how much you know because most athletes haven't raced in a while. It's it's you know it's March, we're about to be in April. It's racing season, April through. I mean, gosh, now it's like till basically middle of November. Mm-hmm. There's races, there are races, there are races, and so it, it's this really tricky balance of, gosh, I've been, I've been, you know, November, December, January, February, March. Here I am. I've been waiting, you know, four or five months, almost half the year, to to have a taste of all this work that I've put in, and all this consistency, and all the days I've restrained myself, all the days I've I've fought back the urge to to run extra when my friends are running extra, when I fought back to to not you know crush myself up this climb on Zwift when people were passing me to not you know do ex- something extra in the gym to not go extra and then they go out and they race and they have a really great race and then it's like oh now I, I can do this now I got to do it more often you know and, and they they get this urge to prove it and to reprove it over and over again instead of kind of taking a step back and, and saying all right that was good that was really good. I see that this is working, and now you kind of step back to regular scheduled programming. And I think sometimes the tendency is to want to either race, 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 because you want to see it, see it, see it. And I just think it's hard. I think I think it's hard once you start to satiate that that racing benchmark, prove it mentality to be responsible for the rest of the year, not bite off more than you can chew. Not biting off more than you can chew, yeah. I mean, that reminded me when you were saying that of an analogy of like going to the grocery store while you're hungry. <laughs> yeah, after a swim. It's a bad decision. Yeah. It's a horrible decision. Yeah, it's like you make these, like making a bad decision within a workout. Sort of like, eh, you know what, this doesn't seem like it's working. Let me push this another five miles <clears throat> and just prove it. But, I mean, realistically, that's, I guess, the topic I did have in mind because... Um, it's just been my consistent running and I talked about this on the video. I was like, and I'm on vacation and it's kind of tough to, to get a lot of stuff in. So I've been running every day since I've been here, just shorter work, but I can tell it's working. I just, I haven't let the horse out of the gate as you always say. And, you know, like yesterday was my third day in a row or whatever. And I got back to the room and I was, oh, by the way, I ran into two of our athletes just randomly uh, running. You you don't need to tell me that. I heard basically two seconds after it happened. <laughs> oh my gosh, I saw Mike today. Oh my gosh, I saw Mike today. Oh my gosh, I saw Mike today. I know. And, so, and I mean, I couldn't be any further from important for most of these people, but it's like when they <laughs> when they catch a glimpse from you from like nine miles away, they're like, <laughs> I saw Mike today. And uh, they, But they also wanted the caveat of, in case you see a stop or a pause in my Garmin, <laughs> uh, it's because I saw Mike, and uh, then like, the subsequent heart rate spike from joy and jubilation from getting to hang out with you for thirty-five seconds. Thirty-five seconds. Yeah, we had to get going, but yeah, shout out to Melissa and Amy for hanging out along the frozen lake and running. Nice job, but um, so yeah, man. I, I, so why is that? Why I, I'm curious about this. Um, just when you're about ready to throw in the towel or whatever, that's the breakthrough moment. Why well, do you I think, think that is, and why does it feel that way? So I, I think I think it comes I think it comes down to a lot of things, and and I think it basically comes down to how and this is kind of it kind of goes on to what we we talked about yesterday and or not yesterday the last podcast in terms of um you know the the uh, the basis of stress and accumulation and what that does to us. Um, mm-hmm. The, the what it does is usually when you start to kind of have an emotional like athletes will see this like you know if you've ever had a friend or you're even yourself or a spouse who's in like the last four to six weeks of a Ironman build or a seventy point three build they are uh, they are almost always in that like triathlon hangry phase mm. and they are super emotional. Uh, about everything it's either the end of the world and they're never going to finish or it's the greatest thing possible uh and it just we we tend to like when things are when we're stretched then when when sleep is when sleep is at a you know 
uh, the hottest commodity you can have and you're not getting enough of it or you're not fueling right or everything is really, really asking you, you know, so much. There's something, everything is being asked of you. And I think in training, when we start to hit these like ends of these builds or in these, the middle of these build cycles, not only is it the amount of volume and stress you're putting on yourself physically, emotionally, and mentally, but it's also the proximity in which something close is about to happen. And I think when you add all those things together, it's the recipe for questionable decisions. I don't want to call it self-sabotage, but it's definitely self-doubt. And so I think when you when you bring on the pressure of a big race, which has been creeping up, you know, like nobody says, "Gosh, like I just I'm really feeling the pressure from this race." Like I just don't know if I'm like, "When is it? Oh, it's November 10th." You know, I just I just I don't know if I can handle. I'm like, you know, nobody ever says that. It's like three weeks out, four weeks out, five weeks out. And so when you increase the emotional amount of uh, discomfort and the mental discomfort athletes can have. And you combine that with the amount of stress they're putting on their body physically, which usually means they're increasing intensity and or increasing volume, and they're not, they're not super rested. Those are all recipes for your mind kind of playing tricks on you. Mm. As in, I, I don't think I'm ready or I'm so tired. You know, woe is me and woe is all of my training. But it's also, you know what? I, I just I, I want it to be over. I I want I want I want my answer now. Mm, yeah. I don't want to wait, which I think is the biggest the biggest kind of part to take away from it is I want my answer now. I don't want to wait any longer. I, I want to do it right now. Uh, I don't want to wait for three weeks. I'm just ready for this feeling of self-doubt or this feeling of I'm not ready or the fatigue. I just want to prove it to myself so I can stop. And, and I do. I think there's a huge release in, in that. And that's also why you see so many athletes to, uh, you know, to basically – I don't want to say ruin themselves or not ruin themselves, but to prove, yeah, prove to themselves when they get done with the race while they're so emotional is because they like, they've held this like emotional mental restraint in for so long that they just think it's over. I can exhale. I mm-hmm. did it. It was worth it. But the closer and the closer you get to the race, that builds up like the steam in a pot, and then you finally release it. But so many athletes don't like that discomfort yeah. of building up that, that pressure. That's tough, man. I mean, yeah, that, that really applies to a lot of things in life. But obviously with racing, I think there's that – you've been training so hard, and you got the physical – uh, the the healing of the the muscles and all the inflammation and all that stuff kind of going up and down and whatever but I mean I've got like this video shoot this week and I've been feeling a similar discomfort you know just because of the unknowns and the you're always because and it's weird for me because this usually doesn't happen but it's kind of a different situation this time with different people and I don't know what to expect so I'm sort of I guess in a way prescribing things that could go wrong. I guess. So it's a weird thing that you got to get out of your head. I think when you're going into a race is you got, it's so easy to think of the things that could go wrong. Right. And then like at, at what point, like why, what, what about me or why do I think that I'm going to be able to, you know, do things that are going to go right. I mean, it's a weird thing how your head starts wrapping around the negatives as the race comes forward. But I mean, because it's hard to be like, oh, it's easy to say, you know, three months before the race on tri you're like, yeah, I'm going to nail this. But then the reality is that you don't feel as good or something, you know, you're not as like outgoing or, you know, uh, pumped up or whatever. And you start kind of going into a shell and it's harder to be uh, brave and bold about your race, you know, a day or two out. It's... It, it it's a way for us to kind of cheat the system and not – because we do. We, we put an em- enormous amount of pressure on ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, whether we like to admit it or not, to perform, to train well. And then the ultimate test is, is this huge – because, I mean, let's be honest. Everyone loves the public display that is training. Look at me working hard. Look yeah. at me putting in the time. Look at me on Strava. Look at me with these screenshots. Look at me with this deer in this forest. I'm out here living life and training. But when it comes to race day, it's a whole different animal. The amount of pressure that, and I think it, it's, I think it 
only combines with the amount of time you spend doing those kind of things, but with the amount of pressure that people put on themselves, they end up either hating racing or they just don't want the spectacle that is racing where it's a culmination of everything that you've done and how how your training went, how you executed your race, what the day gave you and how you did. Yeah. You know what's and funny about oh, that's you, a lot to wait. You know, yeah. and it, it's a lot to put on one day and I think for some athletes they would rather risk it beforehand and not use it as an excuse really, but they just they, they just don't they just they want it's not giving up and I, I'm struggling with the word to put on it. It's just, they just want it to be over mm-hmm. and, and they don't know man. They don't care how it looks, but if I can do it now, it's, it's like, I guess the best analogy I give is like you, you're not sure that you, sh- that you really should be marrying this person. You're in, you're engaged, mm-hmm. but you're just not really sure yet. You have some doubts and instead of like talking to your to your partner or talking it through or going to like premarital counseling to really figure out that you're like you know what screw it I'm just gonna break off the engagement and run a different direction and do a, a total you know a bunch of other irresponsible things mm-hmm. you know it's just like it's it's not saying it through not that you know I condone marriage somebody don't want to but you get the picture it's just it's I think it's hard because of what we do to ourselves. Well. It's. I was gonna say. When, it's funny when we sometimes we'll go to races and I'll we'll have maybe a dozen athletes racing or whatever, and I'll ask you, who do you think is gonna do really well here? And uh, you, you'll you'll go be like, so and so is gonna crush it. And I'm like, why do you think that? And you kind of basically you revert back to showing me uh, these meh workouts, like how they've been just real consistent. Um, they've been they haven't had anything awesome to really show you. It's just been pretty stable and steady it's sort of like if you go into that marriage and you've had like great vacations with that person and you've had a blowout weekend in cancun that was awesome and then but you know during the week it's not all that great and you're starting to doubt it because you you had that super high it's kind of like having that big workout where you're like man i could really do something in this race <laughs> but it's three months ahead of the race and mm-hmm. it just happened to be everything aligned that day you know you rested you ate well two days before or whatever and then you had an awesome workout so all of a sudden you think you can really do something in this race but for the next three months or two months leading up to the race things haven't been really you know there's been no signs of that <laughs> there's been no signs of the cancun weekend lately mm-hmm. so you're kind of starting to doubt that that big day that big wedding day and i guess i've had a lot of those doubts a lot of cancuns my man yeah you've had a lot of cancuns man uh but no i think you know to to what you're saying like i also think that's a that's a great reason as long as it's responsible and you've talked it through with your coach or or your training partners or whoever is to do you know they're not insignificant uh in a lot of other reasons but in terms of like you know, a crushing you for a certain day. They're they're not huge, but these just hop in races, five k, ten k, you know, sprint try, Olympic try. You know, on, on a whim. Like I, I love those as long as they fit in and they're not gonna you know, like you're not like two weeks out from a race. But because what I think it does is it it allows you to to get a real world experience of what you may do. But it also I, I think the removal of like the buildup of pressure and time and obsession and there is no like 260 day countdown clock on your your watch and your phone and your laptop and your facebook page and everything else that's constantly reminding that 245 days 244 days 243 days it's all it, instead of it's like oh hey let me just go sign up and go i think you and i did this maybe two or three years ago like three days before we both decided to race uh, the uh, bridges to bluff. So one of the numbers to bluff is a swim. That the the river bluff triathlon here in Nashville. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I signed you up. You and I decided to whim. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm, it was funny because I remember exactly where I was. You texted me while I was getting family pictures uh, with Allie the day, the day before, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, I think I'll do it." And she gave me the go ahead, and we did it. And I actually raced really, really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think I don't think the I think but a lot that that had in to do training. with the. Yeah, we I think two days before you and I just did like 60, 70 miles on the trace. It was super hot. It was just in training, but I think what was so fun 
And the reason why I raced well per- personally was not because of my fitness, but it was because like it was I, d- I just walked in with I don't want to say no expectations, but it was just it it, it was a blank slate. And I think any time you can race with a blank slate, and what I mean by that is I didn't have goal A, goal B, goal C. You know, based on my dad and my and my previous expectations and last year's results, you know, I should be able to do this and should be able to do that and should be able to do this. It was just like, dude, let's just show up, figure out where we check in, you know, and uh, get our stuff and go, you know. And I just think there's a there's a lot to be gained from those types of races. This was like a, an Olympic distance, I think, or just short of an Olympic. Um, it was great training, but I think just the mentality that you're able to bring into that and the freedom you're allowed to bring into that is tremendous. Yeah. And I think it allows you to race free. And it also allows you these small little opportunities that aren't going to have some huge consequence on maybe the next two to three to four weeks. So it lets you – I guess it's, it's these little pressure reliever races. You know, like you don't need to go out on, you know, crazy t- – tired legs and run an extra five miles but if two two or three days before and if it fits into your schedule and you can adjust it or have your coach adjust it then sure hop in an olympic and just let it rip baby you know and just and just see some of it and then obviously you need to also be objective in saying okay i wasn't tapered so this isn't the fittest i was but you'll see a glimpse of how fit you are and you were like I a great example. I had an athlete yesterday who ran the same patty's day half and she's preparing for oceanside and she travels a lot and has a lot of like surprise vacations, which is awesome uh, for her. Um, but she was like, "Are you really want me to do like a three hour ride the day before?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm not tapering for you for the, I'm not tapering you for this race. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we've got Oceanside in three or four or in three weeks, so no, you don't really get a break. But we're doing it." And so she, she was worried, and then she texted me afterward and was like, "I was 20 seconds off my half marathon PR today." Mm. on retirement i was like see there you go but it wasn't a pr but there were also no expectations but it's still it's that glimpse of fitness that gives you confidence without having to buy it without having to go all in with all your training chips to see some return uh and i just i think there's just tons of value in that glimpsing fitness i like that yeah just a peek you know it's like seeing you nine miles across the lake i don't need to have coffee with mike I just need to see a glimpse. <laughs> you just need to like, see I just need to see a glimpse of Mike. But no, it's it's the just thing, it's, yeah. it's creating opportunities that are that are beneficial and healthy. The other good thing about these hop in races or these unplanned races is you got a built in excuse right there. What do you mean? It means like I just signed up last night, you know. Ah, I, I don't do expect that. much. It you know, I've, I've got my uh, yeah, my my knee's been acting up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're my favorite. I'm just training. I'm just training through it. Just training. I'm just training through, through it. it, baby. I'm just, just training, training through it. it. You know, it's uh, and you, some people will, and you can. You're you're not obligated to not say it, but I think in terms of releasing the pressure and taking a glimpse. And, you know, what I would say is, you know, we always say there's there's only a couple matches you can burn each year. You can you can really only burn, I think, two max three matches a year. That's that's it, because if you don't if you if you try to burn more matches than that, the flame is going to be so insignificant. They're going to think your match isn't even even lit. I sort of understand. I mean, we obviously I know what that means, but what does that mean? Okay, yeah. So let's let, let's kind of talk a little bit about striking versus actual for the, burning. For the kids. Yeah. So what I always refer to it as burning matches. I always, that to me that is the that is burning it down. That is tearing yourself down all the way down to where nothing is left. You you went all in on a race. You tapered hard, and you you left yourself nothing but you know you just you you emptied the tank. You burned your match. That's all you had left. And when you like the next week, you should be basically finished. <laughs> you should feel like doing nothing. And so, when I the, the majority of your years should be building your match and building this opportunity to strike it and have this huge flame on race day and create this big event and to just burn yourself to the ground because you earned it. You know. But a lot of athletes would rather not have two to three matches to burn each other. They'd rather have like. You know, seven, eight, nine, ten, really, really small strikes. Where there's just like a spark. You know, they're more interested in the sparkler. 
you know, and then they are some like nice huge match that burns like a bonfire. Like they they just want a glimpse. Something looks shiny for the second, but there's really not a lot of substance because it's gonna burn out in like two seconds and it's not really worth anything, and it'll cost you. And what I mean by striking the match is basically continuing to build it, and you strike it just to kind of see, you know, because when really it's the moment you we've all you know struck a match. Most of us have. When you strike the match, the the biggest thing that comes is that first initial initial huge flame, because after that huge initial flame, it it dies down. You know, it just kind of trickles down the the match itself. Mm-hmm. So what what you're looking for to strike the match is to just take a glimpse, a snapshot, of that training flame that you've created, and then it's gone, and then and then you you get to basically keep the match. Obviously, that's not real life, but it, it's it's the it's the analogy and it's the picture of. Oh man, I, I can I can kind of see how big this flame might might get. And what's even more exciting is I just didn't waste the whole match. I can keep building it. I don't have to throw it away and start over again. And so I think it's it's a glimpse of what you have what you've built inside. Because I mean, let's let's take just the, let's take the analogy a little bit further. Is you look at a match and thinking, what the hell is this going to do? Uh, it could easily, if if applied the correct way. That little small match can burn your entire house down. Mm. Yeah, and so I, and so I think that when you when you take the analogy a step further in that direction, is man like this could ruin my whole season if I strike it the whole way right now, you know. And so that's or, and, and let it burn, you know, and, and do it at the wrong time or do it within the wrong way. There's just there's so many applications that you can go with in, in this analogy route. But the point being is that you strike it and you look to see. You, it's just it's like. Uh, it's like just getting a. It's like getting a sneak peek of your fitness. Is the is the best way to say it probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're getting a sneak peek. Uh, this is this is what I'm building. I I, I see it, and we in a lot of athletes will see this in training. They'll they'll see these in these what I would consider like the breakthrough workouts. You know, like in terms and the but when I say I think yeah. I think the biggest. <laughs> The biggest issue I have with the term breakthrough workout is the the wide ranging definitions that people have of it. When I think breakthrough workout, I think of a 50 minute run or a different kind of ride that was normal and you're under fatigue and you go out with no expectations and end up just having the ride of your life or the run of your life where – Things felt like you felt like you're pre-Fontaine or you felt like you're climbing the hill like Contador. Like those days to me are the breakthrough days where you you see a glimpse of how fit you're getting, but it wasn't like, all right, today's a breakthrough session. You know, you need to hit two, you know, two 20 minute sevenths of your threshold power, and that's your breakthrough, baby. We're going to see it today. Because then again, you, you raise expectations. And so to me, my definition of breakthrough workouts are. The ones that that aren't planned, but the ones that happen on like a Tuesday, mm-hmm. and so I th- I think that is I think that is the that is my definition. Whereas most athletes, again, it's like I need it's it's the and I think maybe that's that's the gist of the conversation we're having is the athlete's desire and appetite to continuously see planned or weekly breakthroughs and not just the happenstance of allowing them like when i used to work for iron chat fitness athletes would come in like on their off days or they're coming to the gym and they would come in for a special session with the coaches and they would come in just specifically to try and do a new to to lift a a new specific amount on a specific lift Mm. one times out of 10 they might hit it because they're trying so hard to hit it and they, I think they're usually so stressed, or it's not ready yet. They're forcing it. They don't get it. The other nine times out of ten, you know, when their breakthrough happened during a workout, where they're in, where they're in the flow of the circuit and they're training, and they pick up the bar and they're like, "Oh my god, I just I can't believe I just did that." It's it's just it's that progressive snapshot of breakthroughs uh, that I think that I think are huge and crucial. These hop in races count for them, and then just acknowledging that they happen without forcing them is also a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right, man. That's really interesting that you're saying that it's just sort of like those shorter 50, 60 minute runs or whatever, because 
That is sort of how it went. I, I'm trying to remember back to when I started, and it, you have so many breakthroughs when you're just starting the sport because it's like every other workout. You're kind of going further than you did ever in your life. And But now, that is sort of what happens. Like To me, a breakthrough sometimes becomes when I don't look at my watch, I run for 60 minutes, and then I see what my speed, what my average pace was based on the same route that I've been running. And it's lower, and I absolutely didn't feel like I didn't run. You know, I feel like I'm not sore at all. Like, So it's kind of the same thing. To me, that's a weird little breakthrough. It's just that I feel good. And I just did the workout I normally do that kind of kicks me in the butt a little bit. But now, I went a little faster, took it easy. And it's nothing to do with any kind of PR pace or anything like that, but it's just... It's just showing me that I'm getting stronger. And I'm like, wow, man, I could have done that for like another who knows how long. Like I told my buddy yesterday, I was like, I, th- I said, I think I could have ran a marathon today. But I stopped at, you know, it's five and a half miles. But um, those are the little signs that I look for. And, and he, and actually, I was talking to him about it. And he said, and he was talking about the half that I'm doing in Chattanooga. And he said, what do you think you can run? comparatively after doing the swim and the bike because he's not a triathlete and i told him he goes really and and i said yeah i know that sounds kind of weird based on what i said my pace was today for only five miles but i can just sort of tell that i'm getting stronger and i'm not pushing that too hard right now i need that speed stuff but you just know you got more in the tank kind of thing and it's weird, It's and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, how you just want to, you know, you, you show that benchmark, but I've been really patient with that. I can just see it sort of building, the, and I know you got to kind of flirt with it a little bit, but um, I don't know. It's a weird one to really hold back and see the improvement in the hold back, I guess, is the tricky part. <sighs> In a, again, it goes it goes with trust. Mm-hmm. It's all based on trust. It, it's based on trust with yourself, trust in the plan, trust in a coach. But I think I think oftentimes we when we think of the the word trust or you know trust your training you know is a really really common phrase that that people use. It's it like it's like you have to ha- have it immediately. And that trust in, in that I think people f- and athletes forget that trust is gained. Trust is earned. And it has to be a collaborative, a collaborative effort between you, the athlete, and the coach, or you, the athlete, and yourself. And you can't trust something to work or not work if you don't give it a specific or lo- not specific, but a long enough time to materialize to show that it works so that you can trust it. Most some athletes just don't want to trust <clears throat> because they they either have had trust issues before when it comes to training, or with, and you, largely it comes from themselves. You know, largely it comes from past experiences with with coaches or training plans or getting injured or <clears throat> you know, and experiences are important because they're they're that's your life. You know, you you can't you can't fault a person because of their experience. You can't fault a person because of, of their different life experience. And that's how they've that's how they've gained their perspective or how they see things, or how they feel things. And so I think athletes, when it comes down to training, it, it's it's the patience of well, it's frankly, it's uh, it's I just don't have the patience to not know. Because my definition of knowing has to be a finite example every single day. And a lot of athletes it, and then that scares a lot of athletes to just not know, right? And it, it and it doesn't come down to to not trusting. It's I think it's just that confidence, but also I think it also the, the biggest part of it too is just how important it is to them, how important it is to them, not to just see improvement, but how important it is how important it is for them to uh, feel that what they're doing is valuable. Not just in the fact that they want to do it in a materialistic way or an action way, but in a a return. I'm getting I'm getting as much of a return on this as I as I believe I should be getting in with the amount of time and dedication and emotional, mental, and physical investment that I'm putting in it. And again, when you go back to trust, that's why it, it's such a a delicate balance. 
I think, to manage. It is a tough one. And I, you know, I think just being, I think so much of that is that feeling good and like, I, I you know, that's just the closest thing to me because it's day, this run the other day. I just felt so good. Like, I, that's when you know that you can just, I wasn't running fast by any means, but I knew that I could probably literally have gone for a marathon right then at that time. And it wasn't going to be super, you know, PR kind of stuff, but it really made me feel good about the training. And I, that, and to your point about trust, it was, I think it was like that confirmed some trust, you know, and it is hard to, to trust the training, but to be able to say, okay, you know, this is going really well. I feel, I feel really good. I mean, isn't that enough sometimes? You know, feel better and stronger. It can be, yeah. It can be, but again, that's... We don't like to just feel. Like, reassurance for a lot of people is a visual affirmation. Hmm. People love a visual affirmation. That's why... For a lot of people, the data is glorified to them, not because they understand it, but Mm -hmm. because it's a visual affirmation of not self-worth, but improvement based on their, uh, based on their return and that they see it and that they're going the right direction, that they're not lost and they are getting better and they're not wasting their time. And, and this is, this is, this is great. And this is as good as I think it is. So I feel like, you know, that is the biggest question and kind of quandary that most athletes have and they get into is the obsession with visual uh, gratification and visual affirmation. Mm-hmm. And that it's not just about feeling it, which is the same reason so many athletes struggle based on on feel, to run on feel, is that, that doesn't tell me anything or how do I even know Mm-hmm. And I don't understand how does that get me better. And you know, it's they they have to have the visual success or fail. That is the pace of their watch or the watts on their bike computer or the clock in the pool. And then because those all accumulate to this you know data matrix that they have to have that's going to equal out to a digital result on race day that's going to affirm how good that they've done or the, how, how great they've done in training and that this is going the way that I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, obviously that, that makes sense. It's just that I think being able to tap into that understanding of uh, knowing that, Hey, you know, I'm going, you know, nine forty five today on my run. And every once in a while, uh, I'll just sort of start. There's this thing about, when I'm going easy, I'll, I don't know, it just feels like I'm tweaking it up maybe like 1% or 2% my effort. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, it's like, you know, 850s or something like that. But I look at those and I'm like, man, this feels just about as good as 945. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I'm, you see what I'm trying to define here? I can't quite put my hand, um, my, wrap my hand around it. But uh, there's that kind of like, buffer zone in there where you can kind of go back and forth a little bit and just feel good in there it doesn't always have to be the fast end of that but um it's just it's just like i think what it is for me is that i know i have control of this run to this particular pace or effort i can control this right now and i can go and i know that it's sort of that thing about how you hold back or you, you use on an Ironman, you hold, you know, you hold in there until 18 or 20 miles in. And then, you know, if you've got something left, you can push it. I always look for that, that spot all the time. That feeling, what's that like? It, I think it's hard to define until you experience it a lot of times, mm-hmm. which again, I think is, is, <laughs> is part of the, the craving and appetite balance that we have as athletes is that we sometimes we'd rather we'd rather snack than wait for the full meal in in so many areas in training and in racing we'd rather snack 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 and then not and get you know have our appetite satiated for a minute but man we're not willing to wait for that satisfying meal mm-hmm. but then once we get that feeling it's like oh man well now I want to get gluttonous with the whole thing <laughs> now I want to have it five days a week 
because that that feeling is euphoric, and then you translate that into training. I, th- I, th- I think for each athlete, to answer your question, I think I think it looks different for each athlete. Yeah. To and I, I think it's something that has to be experienced because it's different based on their level of uh, their athletic ability, their ability for endurance, their athlete life cycle, how long they've been in the sport, and other stressors in their life. And what's important, success feels different, pace feels different. What makes you feel good about something also feels different. And so I think it's it's a very s- a specific thing. And I think that's that's the most important thing that a lot of athletes kind of uh, don't grasp fully is that training and then the ultimate race, which is your your end goal, you know, or your your midterm exam. S- training and doing these kind of things that are so process oriented is is a is a gigantic uh, journey of self exploration, and. That having that approach can allow it to mean and turn into a million different things, all mm-hmm. all basically good, you know, and, and then hopefully fixing some of, of what you think might be bad. But when you start to have these uniform metrics that follow this linear this linear grade of success or failure, then you then then the clouds and the gray all but cover up what you should be exploring in the interim. And having the patience to continue to explore, because mm-hmm. exploring, it's like they say, like climbing the mountain. Like the peak isn't the most fun; it's the it's the it's the hike to the top that you remember the most, you know. And so, so many times you just want to stop and, and and take a break, or cut things short, or go. Let's just start over again. Mm-hmm. But it's just it's continuous self exploration that we should be having as athletes and as people that can both make this so exciting and so rewarding, but at the same time. Whew, that's a whole lot of mental and emotional investment to, to put to put on something that's just a freaking hobby. Yeah, and I know. so it is. It is. It's just like it's a really hard balance. But again, when you combine all those things together, that's why it's so important. You know. Yeah, you're right, man. Uh, I was just I'm trying to think about. So sometimes you, I think your mind needs permission from your body. And, you know, you hear about yeah. people jump out on the run and they're like, why does my heart rate just shoot through the roof right when I start running or whatever? And it's because your body's probably like, hey, bro, what's going on? <laughs> you know, you're just sitting down five minutes ago and now you're kind of acting like you're going to, you know, it's kind of that uh, flight or fight kind of thing. And your body's trying to be like, wait a minute. All right, I better, better jack this up and it doesn't feel good. But so there's this, there's, I just feel like there's always this point where, your body can definitely go further and you just need to go like, Hey, you know, we're just going to go a little bit further in and they're like, all right, let's do it. And I think you can kind of keep doing that. And, you know, and if, if you, if you respect that relationship between your, your mind and your body and how that goes, it's amazing. I think how far you can kind of just, you know, tweak it and keep going into that space. And I'm not sure if that even makes sense, but I'm just trying to decide. I'm trying to de- like define what I go through when I think about these kind of things because I know that I don't think about things in in terms like a lot of people do, or maybe I do and I just think I don't or whatever. But um, I just I love to push those boundaries, but I have to respect those boundaries. I can't just like completely barge into a whole nother territory all the time. You just have to eke your way in, and I guess that's sort of how I. I think about whether or not I'm getting better, and that's how I build trust with my my body and ultimate training. trust. Yeah, it's like the people that you ultimately like really, really, really trust. You've gone really, really, really deep with. Not yeah. just uh, yeah, like we share a cubicle at work, and we get a little bit there. It's, just, it's like when that's consistent you behavior. You got to go too, deep. Kinda. Like if you exactly. exactly. feel the same way with something, even within your relationship with your body, and your body can learn to respect that and trust that, that's like a friend, you know? Like you're building a friend with that, but if you're one way all the time and then you do some completely out of character, your friends are going to be like, what the hell? Huh? What's going on here? You know? It's, but again, is that what most people are the most comfortable with? No. Most people would rather have friendships or acquaintances where we just go 
to the bar and talk about nothing versus sitting down and having a one on one meaningful conversation that goes really, really deep and creates a in ginormous amount of value, but that may not be the most comfortable the entire time. Mm, that's a really good one. Yeah. It's and that's how a lot of people look at training. It's like, ah, I just would rather, you know, do it on the fringe and just be okay with it. And I don't want I don't want to go deep because it's it's it's, it's scary and it's fun and it's, it's not scary. It's scary, it's not fun. It's vulnerable. It's uncomfortable. I'm putting myself out there yeah, man, but man, like the how full you get from like the end of those kind of conversations, like that's what it's about. But and and again, that's why you see for these athletes that cross these finish lines, regardless of the regardless of the length or the duration of the magnitude of a race, when you see these emotions that cross these people's minds and faces and covers their body almost with their their body language and like you can just read you can read although you couldn't put it into words you can read an athlete's story when they cross the finish line and you might not be able to put it into words but you can see the the enormity and the magnitude of of how deep that story goes and you can only create a deep training story or a deep race um experience not only, but for the most part, by letting yourself go deep and being patient and being process oriented and not taking shortcuts and not wanting to self sabotage yourself. I mean, heck, there's plenty of people. I mean, I used to be this way before I got sober. Like that, you you just didn't want to be in a relationship. You would just self sabotage, and you would much rather blame yourself and and have that that badge of i'm just i just i just don't work out well with people i'm just not a relationship person mm-hmm. then actually really 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 invest in a relationship because you're so scared that's going to end up being really really bad when in the turn it might be really 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 good and even if it doesn't work out at least you learn something along the way and you taught yourself something and so i think training is the exact same way because it's a relationship too it's just how you manage that relationship and how many how many times you, you know, you you want out, or how many times you make bad decisions, and how much you're willing to put in versus how much times you're, you're willing. It's just you can't you can't just invest and withdraw every other week and expect to see a really 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 big return. You've got to invest your training, and then let it sit and invest some more and wait and invest some more. And even when the and even when the race and training market looks like it might crash. Just hang out. Just trust it. It's going to go back up. And you got to have that confidence in yourself or your coach that it's going to go the other way and you just have to be patient. Don't withdraw it all right now because then you're going to take a loss. And at the same point, don't invest it for a day and then withdraw it the next day and expect to see anything but like a two-cent return. Invest, 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 invest. Let it sit. Be consistent. Be smart. Be responsible. Uh, do not give in to impulse. <laughs> Or is something grandiose that makes you bored, and then if finally at the end, then withdraw. You know, do it on a Sunday morning when nobody's looking, and don't post about it. But you you gain this huge return just from being patient and being consistent with your training investment. And I think that's so difficult. But if you really want to yield long term gains and long term results, you've got to be really smart about it. And like you and I talk about all the time, like some of the smartest decisions you and I have ever made, nine nine out of ten of them have all been started with the word no, or no thank you, or I don't think that's a good idea, instead of yes 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 yes. You know, it's just that it's that it's that having that confidence to not do more or not do different, but to stay the course, uh, because it can seem boring and, like this athlete said, it can be eighty percent meh, <laughs> you know. But I guess guess what. Your 10% of making a bad decision a lot of times can totally and completely ruin or compromise all of that 80% meh. And I don't think that's something that most athletes really, really, really want to do. No. That impulse line is important. There's so many There's so many ways you can be impulsive in this sport and I just think that's something really important to keep in mind. Don't be impulsive. <laughs> it's hard, man. Everything is. It's you know, there's just it's it's hard to it's hard to dif- to differentiate. I think and and 
I think you can overanalyze too sometimes if you're if you're making things too complicated or you're letting your ego take too much charge. You know, you just got to really kind of just think about it and think about it and think about it and think about it. As long as it's think about it, think about it, think about it, react or don't react instead of think and react. Then I think you're, you're you're at least you might not always make the best decision in training or in life, but hopefully it's going to usually be better. Um, you know, the, of course, I'll say, like, you know, paralysis by analysis, but, you know, it, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, different ways to be, you know, to deconstruct and be, you know, to totally eradicate and demolish what you're doing by just making a very quick, poor decision based on ego at the moment or, or neglect, you know, or neglecting a, a niggle or a pain or whatever, just because <laughs> you've got to run through it today or you, it's not a big deal. You know, it's 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 those niggles turn into surgeries, and if you don't pay attention, you're not willing to take a step back and look at that big picture and not sacrifice a year for today. Again, it's just it's it's all about decision making. Everything in life is, but it's training especially too. It's 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 about decision making and just making the best decisions that you can and when you can, with the with with that long term vision and understanding that you want to do this for a long time you don't want to risk it all and try to get out tomorrow you want to play the long game and as unexciting and boring and and sometimes on the daily doesn't feel like it's that gratifying because you're not getting that that immediate digital affirmation you know the end result is usually something that you'll be very 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 proud of as long as you allow yourself to get there Mm. all right that sounds great to me man I wrapping it up right more. at an hour yeah That's thanks right. for joining us crushing iron triathlon podcast episode 251 uh we appreciate you listening if you want to find out more about all the other exciting things that we do <laughs> <laughs> that was overblown uh you can go to crushing that solid iron. dude that was an announcer was voice good. i know that was good thanks i've been mean, you know exciting. I'm, getting, I'm getting ready for march madness uh is you can go to crushingiron.com, and we have uh, more info there in our training camps, swim camps, and triathlon camps with availability in August, swim camp in May. Uh, you can find out more details there. Uh, coaching and training options. We also have um, info on swim analysis, blog, videos, our club, you name it. It is there. It's our one-stop shop. Uh, and if you have any questions about anything you see or don't see or wish you would see on that site, you can email Mike directly, crushingiron at gmail.com, or you can email me directly at c26coach at gmail.com. And next week, if things go well, this will be a divided podcast as our Tennessee Volunteers and Wisconsin Badgers meet in the Sweet 16. Oh, that's right. Would that be, yeah, it'd be an Elite Eight game. Would it be? Yeah, I, 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 they released it yesterday. I was, I was out to eat with Hayden and Allie, and I got a small glimpse of it. I, I saw we were in, you're in the Virginia side, and we're below. But um, yeah, it would definitely be. We'd have to be Virginia to get right. To it'd, be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be an elite game. So that, yeah. Uh, and who knows, man? Listen, if if they if they meet in the elite eight, I, I could see you and I making a crushing iron road trip together. Um, That's in Louisville. Um, I'm already. Yeah, I'm yeah, for sure already. Jesus Christ. Well, no, I'm not already uh, going. I already thought about going because it's yeah, in Louisville, I, I, I that, might, might, that regional. Sure. Would be, that would be cool. Um, but, yeah. But we'll you might there. want to go even if for the first game because it's cool, to, you know, just to be at a Sweet 16. Anyway, but, yeah, that was well, a, we'll talk about that off air. But, yeah, thanks for joining us, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll, catch you, we'll catch you on Thursday. Hey, and honestly, that's pretty impressive for us. We didn't even talk about the – March Madness until the 58 minute mark. Mm-hmm. So, to everybody that, you know, talks about not wanting to have us have sports in here, there you go. Yep. So. You're welcome. All right, this was it, 251, and uh, we'll be catching back up with you on Thursday. Sounds good, man. See you, buddy. All right, man. Bye.